the unique advantage that we have at Bolt Storage is that we implement revenue management. Now, revenue management is a tremendously important part of self-storage because since everybody's on a month-to-month -month lease, you can send them a thir on 30 days notice, you can raise the rent by any amount that you want. Welcome to The Nick Huber Show. Let's talk about self-storage. That's why you are following me. It is what I do. It is my asset class in real estate. I built a self-storage facility. Well, I say I, we, my business partner, Dan, and I, um, we built a self-storage facility from the ground up with five outside investors in 2017. May of 2017 is when we opened the doors for business. Started planning the project as a new development in 2015. It was early 2015. It was almost two years from the time that we looked for property to the time that we opened the doors for business. You fast forward to, to today, um, we have almost 5,000 units, 4,930 self-storage units, 24 properties, 642,000 square feet in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. We are putting in offers on self-storage facilities daily. We have four acquisitions, employees that are helping us originate deals. We are growing fast. I mean, we put an offer in on a Georgia property, a Kentucky property, an Indiana property, all in the last four days. So it's a matter of time until we have 50 properties and we are spread out across probably 30 states. Well, maybe 30 states is 18 to 24 months away, but really soon. And if you think about self-storage as an asset class, people often ask me, Nick, can you give us an overview? How do I learn just the basics on self-storage? I think the difference between self-storage and a lot of other asset classes like multifamily, industrial, medical office, office, retail, whatever it might be. The difference between that and self-storage is self-storage is a high touch business. It is an operator's business. It is a business where we deal with, uh, as you can see here, we, we have a cost basis. Let me tell you what our cost basis is. I'm looking at my document right now. Our cost basis in our self-storage portfolio is $34 million. Now you may buy a $34 million industrial building or an office building and you may have less than five tenants. We have 4,900 of them. So what that means, and also all of them are on month to month leases. So what that means is that our business is a operations heavy business. I mean, we can talk about the bottleneck in the business and our bottleneck right now is finding deals as with anybody. Financing is easy to come by. LP capital is somewhat easy to come by now that we have a little bit of a track record of delivering returns and operations for us is blocking and tackling, but that's because I come from an operations background. I started a small business with my partner back in 2011, but the thing that makes self-storage different and it's actually very similar to things like RV parks, mobile homes, is that it's high touch. We have tons of tenants and they're all on month to month leases. So that means that I have an operations company, a company that runs the business with 12 employees focused on that side of the business right now to manage $34 million in assets. That's operations heavy. We answer 75 phone calls a day, 75 emails a day. We process 30 move-ins and move-outs every single day. And we have 30 plus vendors, meaning snowplow, lawn care, cleaning units, cleaning companies, overhead door companies, gate companies, you name it. There's a lot that goes on in the self-storage business. So if you're looking for a passive investment, this is not the one for you, but that's the reason why I love it. Now, if we zoom out and look at self-storage as an asset class, it's really gotten hot. 2016 was a record year as far as value of self-storage facilities, popularity of them as an investment class, the amount of capital that's earmarked that wants self-storage. It's really been nothing but growing, taking off since 2015, 16, 17, 18, record year, 19, record year, 2020, obviously half of the year was spent in a holding pattern. 2021 values have never been higher. We're looking at a whole hundred basis points of cap compression in the last 12 months because so many people are looking for self-storage assets. Now there's different types inside of self-storage. There is the big box class A institutional facilities that you see in your major cities. That's CubeSmart, public storage, extra space storage, life storage, and U-Haul. Those are the five big players. Those five companies own 20% of the market. They own what's called institutional assets. An institutional asset in self-storage means that those big players, those REITs, those publicly traded companies are after them. What are they after? They operate facilities that are 40,000 square feet or larger. If it's U-Haul operates some smaller ones, if it's anybody but U-Haul, they operate self-storage facilities that are 60,000 square feet and up. So your public storage, CubeSmart, extra space storage, you see those multi-story buildings, that's 100% climate controlled. Those are institutional class A self-storage facilities. I don't own any of those. I operate in a totally different world. 
Okay, I operate what's called row facilities, drive up facilities where you see rows of buildings and individual garage doors that you drive up to. This is what self storage was in the 1980s. That's what I do and I don't do it in the major cities. I mean, I'm, I will eventually get a hold of some assets in some major metros, but I focus on tertiary and rural markets. So what I do is buy self storage facilities that are operational at 40, 50, 60, $70 a square foot. What the big players do is they have developers that build self storage facilities for $100 a square foot and they buy them for $200 a square foot and they operate them with three to four full time employees in an office on site. That's much different from my model. My model is to operate self storage facilities in small towns. I operate them remotely, fully remotely with vendors on site, security cameras, automatic gates, fully autonomous. So we have 642,000 square feet and 12 employees that manage them. So that is one employee for every 50,000 square feet. And eight of those employees are in the Philippines at $1,000 a month or less. So when you think about efficiency, overhead, operational costs, I'm definitely cheaper, but I charge a lot lower rents. We charge for a 10 by 10 average across our portfolio is about $90. $90 for a 10 by 10. That's 100 square feet, $90 a month. It's about $10 per square foot per year. Now, what does that mean if you compare it to other asset classes? I mean, class B residential apartments in small tertiary markets, we're getting about the same rent per square feet per square foot, but we don't have utilities or massive amounts of utilities, appliances, HVAC, plumbing, all the things that a house has, right? When somebody lives there. I mean, as far as the operational side of it, that is 80% of our business. And that's what you should be worried about if you're considering getting into the self storage business. It's about keeping the facility clean and answering the phones and having a good software system to manage your operations. We use easy storage solutions. I don't know if we're going to outgrow that maybe soon, maybe not. They're doing what we want to do right now, but easy storage solutions is what we use. And there's a lot of different softwares out of the box, storage, site link, web self storage, which is U-Haul. Those softwares are the CRM, the customer management software platforms that run people's self storage business for them. So that means when customers move into their unit, you can send automatic emails, you can send automatic texts, you can set up automatic billing. It gives the customers a portal to log into to do business with you. Now, returns, that's what it's all about, right? And even though self storage is a more profitable business, as far as an expense ratio, and when you say expense ratio, what percentage of your revenue is expenses? And I'll tell you that on a facility that does $100,000 in revenue per year, you might have a 30 to 40% expense ratio, meaning 30 to $40,000 a year in expenses to operate that facility. So maybe $60,000 in net operating income on $100,000 in revenue. If you start to go up in my model, if you start to go up, that expense ratio drops. Some of our larger facilities are, you know, 166,000 square foot portfolio that is in Elmira, New York, for example. We can operate that one on about a 25% expense ratio. So for every 100,000 in revenue that comes in, we're spending $25,000 in expenses to operate it. That includes everything from property taxes, to utilities, to snow plowing, to lawn mowing, to maintenance, to the things that are on the actual property related to keeping the business going, including our management fee, which as a management fee to each of our individual entities, we charge 6% and $3 a month. That's just what we charge to manage it with a $1,500 minimum. So when you think about the returns that how profitable a self storage facility is, the returns that it generates, it's profitable, the money's there. But as with all things, as with all areas of real estate, the downside is that everybody loves storage. There's more investor appetite for self storage. So therefore the cap rates that it trades at, the returns that you get for every dollar that you spend to buy a self storage facility are smaller. Right now, institutional players are buying at sub four cap medium sized groups. If you're buying a 20 to $30 million acquisition, sub four cap on up, right? I mean, we try to buy at first year, we want our cash on cash yield in the very first year to be north of 8%, meaning we're buying an in place, meaning the cap rate from the previous year of operations, maybe 5%, you know, five cap on what that investors doing right now. And we obviously raise the rents, we do revenue management, and we operate the facility lean cut, cut costs, and maybe we achieve a six and a half to seven going in cap rate. Now that's aggressive. We are spending money to buy these facilities. They're not giving them away. But the unique advantage that we have at Bolt Storage is that we implement revenue management. Now revenue management is a tremendously important part of self storage because since everybody's on a month to month lease, you can send them a on 30 days notice, you can raise the rent by any amount that you want. 
So if you buy a self-storage facility that's below market rent, you can always raise the rents to make more money and revenue off that same asset. And revenue management is something that is, you know, mastered by the big players, life storage, extra space storage, cube smart. If you rent a unit from them three months into your stay, you're going to get a 10% rent hike. They're going to raise your rent 10%. Nine months in after that, they're going to raise your rent another 6%. And then they're going to raise your rent 6% every nine months until you move out. That's called revenue management. And when you look at the grand scale of things, that is insanely powerful in this business. And that is why investor appetite is huge. That is why there's tremendous interest in self-storage facilities because of revenue management. Now, a lot of the small row facilities that we buy, these small these small town self-storage facilities in the $500,000 to $5 million price range, they're operated by unsophisticated owners. And these owners, frankly, do not implement revenue management. They do a $1 to $2 a year price increase Obviously, nobody moves out for one to two dollars. And what happens is over five years, they have sub market rents. Everybody in town's full. The pricing is not high enough. So the thing that we found to be a really serious competitive advantage for us is that we implement big city revenue management into small towns. So there we have it. That's what I do. That is the self storage asset class. Now, if you want to talk about deal structuring, um, lending terms, um, we syndicate our deals. You listen to episode three of this podcast. We do a private equity structure with a preferred return and a hurdle. That's part of it. Raising the money for the deal is a big part of it. As far as acquisitions go, you listen to the last episode about how hard it is to buy right now. We grind. We get resourceful. We try to find deals for sale. We deal with brokers. We deal with off-market stuff. We're constantly underwriting deals. It's a numbers game for us. Now, when you think about the tax advantages, it's the same as all real estate asset classes. Bonus depreciation is huge. The tax shelter behind doing accelerated depreciation and taking those tax write-offs in the beginning, tremendous. Now, loaning or, or getting loans, senior loans from local banks, this is where it changes based on how much capital you're deploying. If you're buying a $1 million up to probably $15 million deal, you're going to have to go through a local bank or SBA. You can get SBA loans in this space too, which provide probably 90% of the purchase price in a loan. They take a little bit longer. I don't like using SBA loans because it's just sellers don't like it when you're going to have an SBA loan because it takes forever. You got to go directly by the book. It's really hard to build a reputation or a uh, build rapport with your loan officer. That said, some of my friends have been extremely successful buying self storage facilities with the SBA loan. I've never done it, so I'm not an exp expert there. We deal with local banks. And you can expect anywhere from 65 to 80% loan to value. Meaning if you're buying a $1 million self-storage facility, a local bank, a local commercial lender will probably loan $650,000 to $800,000 for you to buy that, buy that asset. The rest is generally your equity. That's about it. It's about all I can think of right now when it comes to self-storage. Operations are critical. It's a small business. So the marketing, the phones, the cleaning out units, keeping the place secure, keeping the place clean, running a small business. That's a big, big part of it. But the hard part right now, not the financing, not the capital, it's the finding the deals. Finding self-storage facilities to buy is the hardest part. It is the bottleneck in our business. And if you are interested in the self-storage industry, it will probably be the bottleneck in your business too. Big news, guys. I created a free PDF that details my method on how I analyze a self-storage facility and figure out what it's worth. Give me a pen, the back of a napkin, and a couple metrics, and I can figure out about what the property is going to be worth to me. Um, if you want to download this PDF, click in uh, the show notes, the first link, and you can give me your email address and you get a uh, email right away with a four-page PDF that outlines exactly how I think about um, underwriting or giving my initial analysis on a self-storage facility. Again, click the link in the show notes and you're going to get that document for free. Before you go, we have a new sponsor of the show, recostseg.com. And if you bought a piece of real estate, you need to get a cost segregation study done. It's what allows you to get all that sweet, sweet bonus depreciation. And it's how real estate investors like me and many others pay almost nothing in taxes on an annual basis. You can cost seg a single family rental, a short-term rental, or a large commercial property. Um, recostseg.com is affordable and aggressive and super fast to turn them around. They've done 10 plus cost segs for me this year. They're going to do many more for me. Um, visit recostseg.com to learn more.